Hello from New Zealand's second big pandemic lockdown, and welcome to Halo Wars 2, a game which I personally, even today, am still surprised exists. Halo Wars was one of those games that I never expected to get a sequel, and unlike all these games, there was no infinite wait until the sweet release of death consumed me. Because Halo Wars 2 exists. It's been around for 4 years now, and it was released 10 years after the first. Halo Wars 1 was developed by Ensemble Studios. It was the first game in the series not to be created by Bungie, as well as being the first not to be a first person shooter. While it did receive positive reviews, and sold pretty darn well on release, it didn't end up being the smash hit that I'm sure its creators and fans were looking for. Whether that's due to its overall insignificance in the wider Halo lore, or the fact that it was a bit like Baby's first RTS, rather than a game veterans could sink their teeth into, or a mix of the two, I can't say for sure. Halo Wars would be the last game Ensemble Studios would ever create. So as the years went on after its release, it seemed less and less likely that the idea would be revisited. The concept of Halo RTS to be left by the wayside. Another addition to the ever-growing list of one-off failed video game experiments. That was until 2015 came around, and surprise, Halo Wars 2 is a thing, and it's coming next year. Jointly created by Creative Assembly and 343 Industries, Halo Wars 2 promised to return to the idea of the original with a brand new story, expanded gameplay options, excellent graphics, and a simultaneous release on both Xbox One and Windows PCs. And with the developers of Total War at the helm, plus some truly excellent trailers to hype things up, things were looking very, very good. After a small delay, Halo Wars 2 was released in February of 2017, with very similar reviews to its predecessor, along with a lot of the same positives and negatives, such as the presentation and mechanical depth, respectively. But I'm never one to take launch day reviews as gospel, and Halo Wars 2, like I said, is over 4 years old now. So let's answer the simple question. Should you play Halo Wars 2 in 2021? Like its older brother, Halo Wars 2 is a fast-paced, action-focused real-time strategy game that's meant to be both welcoming to genre newcomers and engaging for RTS enthusiasts alike. It shipped with an 8 hour or so campaign, a direct sequel to the original, and a few different multiplayer and skirmish modes. In skirmish, matches play out in most of the same way every time. Develop your base, fight some smaller battles across the map as you and your opponent vie for control points and forward base deployment zones until one of you can eventually overpower the other with blobs of units. Things do differ in the campaign though, where across its 14 missions and 2 DLC expansions, there's a lot more unique scenario designs with multiple objectives, stages, and layouts to keep things interesting. Halo Wars 2 is set 28 years after the original, and shortly after Halo 5, which brings us right into the current Halo timeline. A stark contrast to the original, which had been purposefully set in the past to avoid any interference with the then current events of Halo 3 and Reach. And for those who have played Halo Wars, you'll remember it ended on a bit of a cliffhanger, with the crew of the Spirit of Fire entering cryosleep as their ship slowly drifted through the cold void of space, Stargate Universe style. God, I miss that show. Like, I know the question of what happened to the Destiny crew will never be properly answered because it's been over 10 years at this point, but man, it still hurts. Side sidetracked, sorry, right, back on topic. So unlike SGU, Halo Wars 2 is able to give the answers we're after, as the game opens with all the previous game's characters waking up in a crisp, high quality, with somewhat altered appearances, thanks to the advancements in motion capture and animation technology since the original. From the get-go, we are reintroduced to the Spirit of Fire and her crew, Sand Sergeant Forge, who gave his life at the end of the last game. Spoilers. But everyone else is there, Cutter, Professor Anders, and the Spartans Jerome, Douglas, and Alice, who we follow to the surface of a massive forerunner station called the Ark. It's a whole reason the ship's AI woke everyone up from cryosleep to begin with. Before it yeeted itself, that is. It's here we're introduced to Atriox, the game's primary antagonist and marketing material poster boy. He leads the Banished, a Covenant splinter group who is able to hold back the Covenant themselves in open combat. And if that piece of information isn't enough to convince you that they are a serious threat, then seeing Atriox absolutely body our three Spartans in one-on-one -on -one combat, and nearly killing one of them, certainly will. From there, the story doesn't take many twists and turns, and it plays out mostly how you'd expect. Cutter rashly decides that the Spirit of Fire has the strength to take on the Banished, despite him only having one ship, and the fact that the Banished could hold off the entire Covenant, but hey, you know how this goes. It's nothing a rousing speech can't solve. 
Across the game's 14 missions, you'll fight the Banished across the arc in a variety of different scenarios and missions. Narrative aside, the design of the missions is quite good and it's interesting throughout thanks to its unique objectives and mission setups. Sometimes you're leading a single Spartan or fire team through a map with limited resources, other times you're taking part in what's basically a tower defense game, and others you're back to basics and just told to destroy the enemy base any way you can. Each mission is about 30 minutes to an hour long, so nothing tends to overstay its welcome. While I did quite like the narrative overall, I did want to holistically talk about it now that I've finished the whole game. There will be spoilers obviously, so skip ahead to this timestamp if you don't want to hear them. Right, firstly, Atriox, I think he's a good villain. He's big, he's menacing, he looks the part, and he's a legitimate threat to our heroes. Every time he appears or talks to you in game, you get a little worried, for good reason. You know he's tough and that he's out to get you. But the only problem is that he's hardly ever there. For a guy who's on the cover of the game and in all the game's trailers and marketing, Atriox is in the game for a surprisingly short amount of time. You see him at the start, a couple of times throughout, and briefly at the end. He's hardly even in his DLC. Most of the time you're either fighting his lieutenants or miscellaneous unnamed banished forces. What's worse is that the fight against him is never over, which leads me into my second point, the ending. So at the end of the game, Anders gets into the Ark and launches a newly created Halo Ring, which she is then aboard as it jumps into slip space with her promising to Captain Cutter that she'll return with UNSC reinforcements for the rescue. So she goes, leaving Cutter and the rest to fight Atriox in one last big cinematic battle. Eh, uh, just kidding. No, the game ends like that. There's no showdown against the King Brute, just an implication that the biggest fights are yet to come. Oh, also, Anders doesn't even make it to her destination. She instead finds herself face to face with a Forerunner Guardian. Mark down one more cliffhanger. So, I mean, yeah, I like the story and I love the characters, but I'm just upset that it's likely not to be concluded in a third entry. 343 have publicly said they aren't currently considering making a sequel to Halo Wars 2, so with the cliffhanger of an ending, this basically leaves us in the same position we were in after Halo Wars 1. With that said, however, it looks like the Banished may play some sort of role in Halo Infinite, so if that's the case, it would be great to have that game tie up some loose ends. Or at least answer a few questions. The campaign story does continue in Halo Wars 2's two DLC campaigns however, but they don't add anything to the overarching story and are mostly independent additions. Starting with the smaller of the two, Operation Spearbreaker takes place one month after the base game, but it doesn't really move the story forward at all. It's just a couple of missions with a simple and closed narrative, with consequences that, while dire if they did come to pass, are ultimately avoided. The much meatier and more interesting Awakening the Nightmare DLC brings a lot more to the table. Set five months after the main game, this expansion follows two brothers under Atriox who are working to secure more resources for the Banished's dwindling supplies, with the war between them and the UNSC having reached a stalemate. Now, how they look to achieve this is by digging around and inside the decrepit Covenant Holy City ship of High Charity. And if you know your Halo, you'll know that that's a terrible idea. As you can expect, this happens. I like the idea of this campaign, I do, and I love being able to play as the Banished outside of Skirmish. I just wish it featured Atriox more and added to the overarching story, rather than just being mostly standalone. Again, I hope Atriox is being saved for Halo Infinite. The two brothers Pavium and Vordis who fill in are entertaining enough as they bicker away at each other, but they're an ultimately forgettable pair. Like the base game, the mission design is pretty darn good, aside from one mission which is a bit tedious where you have to guard a scarab as it progresses through the map, but as always, seeing the flood on screen is exhilarating, and it tends to spice up any mission they're in which of course is this whole DLC. I really enjoyed how they implemented more like a force of nature here, rather than a bunch of individual units. Seeing them flood, no pun intended, over the walls is terrifying. The DLC is quite short with only four missions, but is overall a solid, if a little expensive addition to the game. And any opportunity to see more of these cutscenes is one I'm going to capitalize on. As you've been seeing throughout this video, Halo Wars 2 looks fantastic, 
and unless I'm forgetting something, I think it might be the most graphically impressive RTS I've ever seen. It's certainly up there, though these guys might have something to say about taking the top crown. Every aspect of its visuals is an absolute spectacle. The cutscenes, which were created by Blur Studio, are incredible, and illustrate how much they've developed as a studio since their work on the original. The characters look fantastic and the effects are really jaw-dropping. The whole thing is basically just a huge flex on any other strategy game cinematic, and it's really refreshing to have an RTS campaign be presented with such high production values on par with the best AAA games out there. And on a story level, they really help in connecting you with the game's characters, giving a sense on everything that's going on from their perspective, much more than a zoomed-in camera with canned animations ever could. These are backed up by some convincing performances, and I found myself getting really involved with the characters as the campaign progressed, especially in the midst of missions where situations were getting dire and things were serious. Moving to the actual game visuals, I was caught quite off guard when seeing them in action for the first time. I'd seen screenshots before and they looked pretty good, but figuring that marketing screenshots aren't the best representation of how a game will usually look in the flesh, I didn't think much of them. But playing it, wow, it looks way better than the marketing. When everything's in motion, cannons are firing, vehicles are exploding, it really is one of the most impressive strategy visual experiences out there. The particle effects are amazing, the model and animation work is top notch, and the overall art direction is really well put together. Everything is super detailed, and seeing these units deploy into different modes, or spool up and fire their array of weapons is intoxicating. Even just the bases running through their animation loops are impressive. When dropships are bringing in supplies, and cyclopses are rolling out of the factory, it gives a great sense of authenticity to the game. It feels alive, and brimming with personality. It's complemented by a soundtrack that, while nothing spectacular, does a good job in accentuating the game's highs and lows. And it certainly does fit the universe, as did the OST for the first Halo Wars. That being said, I did find it a little generic for the most part, though there are some pretty good ones in there. Halo Wars 2 is unlike most strategy games you might have played before. Being created from the ground up for consoles as well as PC, certain liberties had to be taken with traditional RTS design to make it feel at home wherever it was being played. As mentioned, Halo Wars 2 features two playable factions, and at a core level, both operate in basically the same way, with smaller differentials sprinkled throughout their unit, building, and tech options. It starts with your main base of operations. This acts as a hub for building support structures, training basic units, and upgrading that base's overall tech level. You expand your operation by building structures on dedicated sites surrounding it, the amount of which is increased as you progress through the text tree. Building selection is limited. For the most part, there are unique production facilities for the game's unit types, infantry, air vehicles, etc. And aside from a few differences, which we'll talk about soon, this is mirrored almost identically across both factions. There's also of course those for resource generation, which like the original game are supply and electricity. In fact, if you're familiar with the original, then all of this might sound very similar, as most features from Halo Wars 2 are basically ripped verbatim from its predecessor. One change I do really like though that I'd like to mention briefly, is how buildings are now not only more visually distinct, but also have pop-ups as you hover over them to say what they are. A big gripe I had with the original game was how difficult it was to tell each structure apart without giving it more than a cursory glance, especially for the Covenant, and I'm glad to see that addressed here. Back to the familiarities though, that's not all to say Halo Wars 2 hasn't deepened its gameplay since 2007. Pretty much everything in the game has been improved upon from the original. To start, there's more unit variety across both factions, a lot of which are quite unique and do a lot to make gameplay deeper and more interactive. The Banished Bristleback in particular is a standout and favourite of mine, being able to swap between modes is really fun, and it looks sick. Faction abilities are broader, more varied, and are more numerous across their leaders in skirmish and multiplayer. Plus, there's a few more distinctions between the humans and aliens than were in the original game, such as how they both construct their defences, and the special abilities acquired throughout their tech trees. Unit variety is also something that's improved significantly. There are more options for infantry, vehicles, and aircraft, with some sporting unique or switchable modes, like the previously mentioned Bristleback, or powerful abilities and upgrades. It feels like you could feasibly make an army without including every unit in the game in it, something I couldn't say about the original Halo Wars. 
Combat is deeper thanks to all this and I really like how the game handles different unit types interacting with each other. Most can attack all other types of units to varying degrees, banished reavers are anti-air, UNSC snipers are anti-infantry, etc. But most, even if they are specifically geared to perform a certain task, can engage all targets, just poorly. It's indicated by these coloured graphics in the build menu. While of course there are some which are hard limited to filling a niche role, such as being solely anti-air, having most units being able to attack most things, even with a puny little gun like this one, makes each unit feel more impactful and less like a dead weight on your population limit when they aren't being used. However, despite all that there's unfortunately still not much nuance to be found in skirmish matches. Only having two factions really limits your options, plus there's not much movement in the tactical depth department and progressing down the tech trees is always the same. Each match is pretty much just a repeat of the last, build the same structures, work towards the same powerful units, and unlock the same abilities. The only differing factors are the faction and leader you choose, and what map you play on. Like the original, this remains the biggest slight against Halo Wars 2's credentials as an RTS, and will likely cause any strategy veterans to likely look over it thanks to its simplicity and lack of variety compared to other RTSs available today. I can't shake the feeling that if the developers had decided to add a new faction or two in the form of the Flood or Forerunners, that they would have helped to alleviate this issue. Two factions is pretty rough, and even if they were a skirmish only or even a DLC based edition, I think that would have helped a lot. To help offset the problem of depth however, there are a couple of unique modes available to help make Halo Wars 2 more of an attractive offering for those seeking variety. To start, the entire campaign can be played co-op, which is nice. There's also Firefight, a fun for a while horde mode that mirrors its implementation in other mainline Halo games. There's also Blitz, the most unique of the bunch. It's meant to be a streamlined, faster paced version of the regular game, while also taking inspiration from card games like Hearthstone. You build a deck of units to take into battle, leaving the monotonous tasks of building a base and harvesting resources behind you. Honestly, it is fun, but as with any card game, victories will often come down to the luck of the draw rather than pure skill. Also, it's monetized to hell via card packs, and while you do earn a decent amount of them through gameplay, I'm sure Microsoft would have liked you to skip the grind and pay with some cold hard cash. The caveat to this whole thing, however, is something you might have already guessed. There's not much of a community left online playing Halo Wars 2 in 2021. So much so, I couldn't find any multiplayer games at all, regardless of mode, after searching for a long, long time. I swear I found more people playing Command & Conquer Renegade last month, that is more than zero. So if you want to play a regular game of PvP or Blitz, you'll likely need to bring some friends along. Thankfully, there's also full crossplay between PC and Xbox, so if you are doing that, you're not short on options. Although I'm a career PC player, I thought it would also be prudent to try the game out on Xbox too, just to see how it plays on a couch with a controller. I'd heard good things before doing so, but I had to see for myself. So I grabbed a controller, booted up the free demo, and played some Blitz, and yep, confirmed it plays pretty darn good for a console ITS. The controller layout makes sense, moving around the camera and ordering units isn't too difficult, and the UI is easily legible sitting back on a couch looking at your TV. If you're hesitant about playing it on Xbox, don't be. While I still prefer it on PC, I'd be more than happy if this was what I had. What's next? Halo Wars 2 on Switch? After spending the last few weeks with Halo Wars 2, I can honestly say I've really enjoyed my time with it, much more so than my time with the original. In fact, it's probably the RTS I've enjoyed playing the most since Total War Warhammer 2, and like it, I'll be returning to it after I've completed this review. No, Halo Wars 2 is not a super deep RTS with endless strategies and options that will keep you thinking for hundreds or thousands of hours. But it knows what it wants to be, an accessible strategy game with quick and simple gameplay loops with nearly flawless high quality presentation. As well as being an authentic Halo game that adds to the lore and overall universe while retaining the characters everyone was familiar with from the original. It's a shame that its multiplayer component and unique modes are basically dead unless you bring a friend and that Blitz is monetized in the way it is, but if you're okay with it just being a solo experience then I highly recommend playing Halo Wars 2 in 2021. It's on Game Pass, so you can get it for cheap, and if you love it then you can buy the two DLC campaigns separately, as I did. Now, to be honest, I feel like I enjoyed Halo Wars 2 more than the average person, judging by its Metacritic scores and results on this community poll I ran a couple of weeks back. It seems most of you thought it was just okay, and there were some interesting comments on why some people held that opinion. 
Myriad said they'd played it after buying it full price with all the DLC and found that it was worth it. A straight upgrade from Halo Wars. Couldn't agree more. Cellar Dwellers said it was mediocre in their opinion. Maybe because they'd played a lot of PC RTS games, but they felt that neither one of them offered particularly deep mechanics. B Money 1337 honestly thinks that Halo Wars games are really underrated. That neither one is super deep, but they look and play great, and the soundtracks are fire. They also captured the Halo universe well. I agree with that big time. Master Sieve said it sucked ass. They'd only played two hours and shut it off. Coming from Command and Conquer, Act of War, Starcraft, Company of Heroes, the game is just a dumbed down console game. No strategy at all. Just build units. No defensive strategies, no depth, just brainless sending in troops with brackets spectacular battles. I can't fully disagree with that. I think people just have different priorities. Anyway, thanks to everyone who voted, and especially thanks to those who commented. I do really appreciate it. And thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, then consider a sub to the channel. I would truly appreciate it. If you do want to support what I do here, consider joining my Patreon or becoming a member here on YouTube. You'll be joining Chocolate Shake, Crispy Robo Chicken, T Edits, Crizzy218, David DeBolly, hope I pronounced that right, Jeremy Algood, Dikayo, and Standby for Systems Nominal, who supports me at the Paladin tier. Thanks very much. A couple of questions here to answer in the credits. Jeremy Algood asks, are there any more perks that you plan on adding to your memberships here on YouTube? I'm not sure. If you have any suggestions of things you'd like to see, I would love to hear it. I don't love the idea of splitting content off from people who pay and people who don't. Even if it's behind the scenes stuff, I feel like if people do want to see that, I would like to offer it for free, maybe on a second channel. But um, yeah, if you have any suggestions, uh, let me know and I will do some more thinking and uh, I will maybe post a poll at some point and have a think about what some other things could be I could add that don't take away too much time because you know, I don't want to do too much on the side and not have time to make videos. I would just want to make videos. Thanks for the question. Standby for Systems Nominal asks, G'day Z, from an Aussie to a Kiwi. Hope you're doing right during these lockdowns. I am, thank you very much. Anyway, I got into Team Yankee recently, an alternate 1985 Cold War Gone Hot tabletop war game made some by lads in New Zealand. I paint and assemble tanks, helicopters, jets and infantry to keep myself sane during this lockdown. I personally main West Germany with a small attachment of an Anzac armoured company. How about you? Do you play any tabletop games? Well to answer the first question, how about you? If I had the choice I would main all Anzacs because, you know, I couldn't do anything else. But to the second question, do I play tabletop games? No. To the dismay of a lot of my mates, I'm generally not a uh, board game kind of guy, uh, but I have played tabletop games in the past. Funnily enough, when I was doing my uh, review for Dawn of War, I got caught up watching some uh, Warhammer 40k tabletop games, and even though I don't think I would have the patience to play them, they look really cool, and I'm a videographer in my quote-unquote normal job, so I would love to like video some things like that and make like cool stories out of them, I don't know, I'm sure there's some sort of opportunity there. Thanks for the question. So I really do appreciate all of your continued support. I know my release schedule over the last few months has not been as frequent as you or I would prefer, but there's just a lot going on right now. And while it may not be for a little while yet, I do hope to return to more frequent releases sometime in the future. But for now, I do apologise. But hey, at least I pay company tax on my profits here to the New Zealand government, unlike food company Sanitarium, which don't pay anything on their profits due to them being owned by the Seventh Day Adventist Church and claiming exemption as a charity. Yes, I'm sure that 10 million made a profit in 2019, and notable advantage over your competitors is purely for charitable purposes, and absolutely nothing else. Anyway, don't buy sanitarium products, have a great day, and thank you very much for watching. I'll see you all next time.